Good evening and welcome uh, to the first meeting uh, this academic year of the Harvard Global Orthopedics Collaborative. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, as a quick way of introduction, uh, HGOC is a group of faculty and trainees affiliated with the Harvard Combined Orthopedic Residency Program. Um, and we are dedicated to improving access to musculoskeletal healthcare globally. As a group, we believe in health equity and social justice. And every month we meet just like this uh, to discuss our global partnerships and projects and also topics relevant to global orthopedics. Uh, so for the first meeting this year, it's uh, my pleasure to say that we decided to address a very important issue in global health, in orthopedics and in healthcare in general. And that topic is racism, implicit bias and structural racism. Uh, so, um, before we begin, I would just like to, you know, very humbly ask that we, uh, all, that everybody mutes their microphone so that we don't have any uh, unanticipated interruptions, uh, but please do turn on your video if you feel comfortable. Um, we will first hear from Dr. Emmanuel Mensa, and then we'll have a panel discussion with all of our discussants. Um, just for the sake of streamlining the conversation, I would like to ask everybody to please post any comments or questions you have into the chat box. I'll try to work them into our discussion as we go, and we'll try to answer all of them during the course of the discussion. Uh, we'll also have a little bit of time at the very end for comments from participants. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panel. Um, I'll start with our, um, our discussant. So first I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Michelle Joseph. Michelle Joseph is a visiting scholar in the program in Global Surgery and Social Change at Harvard Medical School. She graduated from University College London and trained as an orthopedic and trauma surgeon uh, on the uh, Warwick Orthopedic Program. Uh, she is um, interested in trauma systems development in low and middle income countries, health equity frameworks, and civilian military healthcare engagement. Next is uh, Dr. Shana Lipa. She is an orthopedic spine fellow at NYU Langone uh, Medical Center. She received her MD with distinction from UCSF School of Medicine, MPH from the Harvard School of Public Health, and completed her residency program just a month ago at uh, the Harvard Combined Orthopedic Residency Program. Uh, her research interests are the impact of healthcare reform on orthopedic quality of care and racial, ethnic, and gender disparities in orthopedic surgery. We have Dr. Amanda McCoy, who is a consultant orthopedic surgeon and interim orthopedic residency program director at Tenwek Hospital in Bomet, Kenya. She is a fellow of the College of Surgeons of Eastern, Central, and Southern Africa, and she received her MD from Duke Medical School, MPH from the Univers University of North Carolina uh, School of Global Public Health, and completed her residency also at the Harvard Orthopedic, uh, the Harvard Combined Orthopedic Residency Program. Uh, she is dedicated to pediatric orthopedics and adult orthopedic trauma care, resident in medical education, and care of the underserved. Next is Dr. Timulehan Wusu, or just Wusu. He is an attending orthopedic surgeon and sports medicine specialist at Northside Hospital in, Lo in Lawrenceville, Georgia. He received his MD from Northwestern and completed his residency also at the Harvard Combined Orthopedic Residency Program. Uh, he is uh, dedicated to patient care, raising his two beautiful daughters, and improving the lives and well being of marginalized people. Uh, last but not least, certainly, is Dr. Augustus White who was the orthopedic surgeon in chief at Beth Israel Hospital for 13 years. He's the Ellen and Melvin Gordon Distinguished Professor of Medical Education, Professor of Orthopedic Surgery at Harvard Medical School, former professor of the Harvard MIT Division of Health Sciences and Technology, and former advisory dean of the Oliver Wendell Holmes Society at HMS. He currently serves as the director of the Culturally Competent Care Education Program at HMS, and Dr. White is an internationally known authority on biomechanics of the spine, as well as issues of diversity and inclusion. He's nationally recognized for this work. He's the founding president of the J. Robert Gladden Orthopedic Society, an organization dedicated to the enrichment of diversity in orthopedics. And then for our keynote address, I would like to introduce Dr. Emmanuel Mensa. He is firm chief and hospitalist in the Department of Medicine at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, and an attending physician at Tema General Hospital in Ghana. He is also a former consultant for McKinsey and Company. He lectures on implicit bias at various clinical grand, uh, department grand rounds and teaches a class on implicit bias at the IDMC, the HMS HSDM faculty leadership development course and Harvard Medical School and at Harvard College. And now I'll hand things over to Dr. Mensa for his talk, A Look in the Mirror. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Thank you, Karen. 
Um, it's a real extraordinary honor to be here to talk to you, folks. This is, this is a real honor. And when Kiran invited me, I was really excited to come and talk to you all. Um, I spent a lot of my time traveling um, to some of the poorest areas in Ghana. And I also spent a lot of my time pre-COVID traveling to some of the C-suites of some of the largest companies, health systems in the world, in the U.S., through my work with consultants. And the one thing that I'll be honest with you, I always loved is coming back here to Longwood, to Boston, to Harvard, uh, because throughout my time here, both as a medical student and you know, through my training as a faculty now firm chief, there's always this concept of treating everyone with respect and dignity, no matter who they are. And so that's why I'm here to talk to you today, because honestly, I love this concept. Um, actually started learning about this concept. The reason I love it is because of my mother. Uh, growing up, I, I loved my mother. I still love her, don't get me wrong. Growing up, I loved her even more. And she, without much of an education in Ghana, she used to teach us these concepts through proverbs and stories, those who had touched light into the world. And so I remember as a kid in Ghana, my older brother, my little sister and I would sit on the floor. She would sit on the low stool and she would tell us a story once upon a time. And we would say time, time. And the story that really emphasizes concepts to me was the story of the lion and the mouse. And so I'll share it with you. Um, once upon a time, there was a lion. The lion was big, strong, powerful, king of the jungle. But this lion was also very kind. It treated everyone with respect and dignity, no matter who they were, especially the small animals like the lion, like the mouse. And so one day, this lion was taking its evening walk and it got stuck in the net, could not get out. Luckily for lion, mouse was also walking by and taking its evening walk. And mouse heard the lion screaming and mouse said, yo lion, what's going on there, are you okay? And lion said, I'm not. And if man comes tomorrow morning, he will kill me. And so mouse ran home, called all his 30 extended relatives. They came, they chewed the net and the lion was free. And so for me growing up, the lion always symbolized that animal that represented this concept of treating everyone with respect and dignity, no matter who they were. And until I went to the zoo and I saw them feeding mice the lion one time, but that's a different story. But it still represented that. Um, however, over the years I've been here, I've also come to realize that this is not always true. And especially in the outside world. And it honestly hit me after the death of Philando Castillo. Um, Philando was around 33 years old when he was killed. He was driving home from a haircut with his girlfriend Diamond, who was sitting next to him and her daughter in the back seat. He was stopped by a police officer for reasons unknown. Some said his nose resembled that of a criminal they were looking for. And within a few seconds, he had seven bullets in him. Um, and he died. This case became very popular because Diamond, his girlfriend at that time, live streamed this on social media. And it, it didn't really hit me, I'll be honest with you, until the next morning. I was having my usual 5 a.m. breakfast, listening to my BBC Africa news, um, when all of a sudden, I started crying. I was crying uncontrollably that morning. And honestly, I honestly did not know I was crying. Uh, it took me a while to realize I was crying in that moment, not just because I was afraid for myself, but I was afraid for my future unborn son who will one day come into a world where he has to deal with people's explicit and implicit biases. I was afraid for my unborn daughter who will come into a world full of gender bias and has to deal with people's explicit and implicit biases. And this was a time when a lot of young black men were getting killed by the police. And so that Sunday, I went to church. Uh, this is a black church in Matapan, uh, full of energy. Everyone is always yelling, amen, amen. The old ladies, they wear hats so big. If you sit behind them, you will not even <laughs> see the podium. It, it's a full of energy place. I, I just love going to that place. But 
that day it was different. It was really quiet. And um, under the sullen tune of amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me, the pastor asked all the men to come forward. And so there were 300 or 400 of us and we all went forward. And he asked us to hold each other's hands. And he asked the women who were standing behind us to stretch out their hands and pray for our safety and protection. Now, halfway through these prayers, I opened my eyes and I looked at the man on my right. Um, he was around 80 years old or so, and he was crying. Uh, as I looked at him, I could not help but wonder about all the conscious and unconscious biases he has had to deal with, especially in a city as segregated as Boston. On my left was a young boy, probably 16 years old as well. And as I looked at him, I could not help but wonder about every time he grows an inch taller, his mother must be scared. Afraid that one day he will not wake up because of someone's implicit or explicit bias. And he was also crying. And as I looked around the room and so many people were crying, I cried again. And the next slide is really difficult for me because I teach this topic multiple times a year for the past four to five years. And every time I get to the next slide, I am able to find an updated picture of a black person killed by the police. <clears throat> Eight minutes, 46 seconds. Eight minutes, 46 seconds. Um, and so for years, I have been talking about a look in the mirror, really looking at our own implicit biases and trying to do something about it. But today, I'm not just here to do that. I'm also here to look, talk to you about a look outside the window. And as Du Bois said, really unleash the veil and really look at the structural racism that exists in the system that creates some of these dynamics. And honestly, how I started learning about this topic was actually over a cup of coffee. I have a really good friend, Ben Davis. He's this white kid from uh, Connecticut, really smart guy. Every time Ben and I meet to drink coffee, I've known him for a long time. We have some of the most amazing conversations from Trump to Obama to whatever topic it is, he knows everything. And in one of our conversations, he brought up this topic of implicit association tests. And I asked Ben, yo, what's going on with this? What is this? And how Ben described it to me is that it's a concept within social psychology that assesses a person's automatic associations. So let me give you an example. We all have ideas of what is good and what is bad in our heads. We also have concepts of, of things. And so, when you think of a doctor, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? You think of something good, something safe, hopefully good looking. Um, these are all the things that you think about. And so Ben wanted us to take this test on race. Now I was highly concerned because I've known Ben for a long time. And my fear was if his results came back against black people, this might destroy our friendship. But Ben was insistent. And so we went to the website, implicit.harvard.edu, and how the test does is it makes associations, white or bad, black or bad, white or good, black or good. And it comes out with the results. And lo and behold, this was Ben Smith's result, automatic preference for white people over black people. Now, this was really disappointing. I've known this person for a very long time. And now I've, I've been put in a position where I have to talk to him about race. I have been put in a position where I have to tell him that this is not okay. And I never asked to be put in that position. 
However, what made the conversation even more difficult was that this was also my result. I took this test six more times, to be honest with you, after this. I was like, this is not true. <laughs> and each time, this was my result. And at first, I was like, hold on, wait, hold on a second. First of all, I'm from Ghana. I believe in international understanding. I believe in causing a renaissance in Africa. I work in Africa. I have black patients. Black, what is going on here? I was really confused and frustrated. And so within that frustration, I decided to go on a journey, a journey to really explore my own hidden biases and also understand some of the structural racism in place that exists. And so my journey began with this book by Dr. Mazarin, who actually helped mentor me through the slides when I first started teaching this. Um, and I'll share with you two examples from her book. Number one is, what is the difference between these two tables? Now, most people will say one is green and one is blue. Some will say one is long and one is short. Well, the truth is the only difference between these two tables is their color. And if you don't believe me, let me move this to the side, turn it around, exactly the same size. And yet when your brain first sees this, it tells you something different. I'll share with you a second experiment. What is the difference between box A and B? Most will say A is dark gray, B is white or light gray. And yeah, help me out here. If I put two gray lines next to A and cover up with a blue box, you will say A is equal to the gray lines. If I do the same thing with B, you will say B is equal to the gray lines. Therefore, A and B must be equal. And yet when your brain first sees this, it tells you something different. These are what we call visual mind bugs. And just as we have visual mind bugs, so we have social mind bugs. The challenge with social mind bugs is that they cause unintended disadvantages to others. And so my journey began by looking at my own hidden biases in healthcare and how I could address them. And I started with this report from 2003 by the Institute of Medicine. And why did this report come out? Well, it came out because at that time, there were lots of studies that showed the majority of Americans were unaware of the disparities faced by black folks in the country. I'll give you that this paper came up in 2016 JAMA and I find it interesting that it calls it black gains, but things like HIV, black people die 7.5 times more than white people. Is HIV more powerful in the blood of black people than white people? And this goes to so many other conditions from coronary bypass all the way to kidney transplantation in children. Even in orthopedic surgery, whether who gets rehab, who gets a knee and to tape total joint arthroplasty, or even outcomes of femoral neck fractures. The study came out looking at uh, um, using race to understand what are the complications and mortality based on race. Shows that if you're a minority, you have an increased risk of com complications. And the question is why? I'll give you one last example, a BIDMC. We do about 50 something or so kidney transplants a year. And with kidney transplants, the best is living donor transplants. In 2016 at BIDMC, out of the 16 kidney transplants we did, only one went to a black person. In 2015, we did about 19 or so living donor transplants, zero went to a black person. And the question is why? Yet when COVID came out, lots of reports out there about how Blacks were disproportionately affected. But with all these disparities in healthcare, this was not a surprise. This was not surprising of an outcome. And whenever the question of why comes up, being the smart people we are, we have so many reasons, insurance, money, genetics, socioeconomics, so many reasons that we come up with. But the one thing we don't talk about is hidden bias, and the Institute of Medicine actually concluded that bias on the side of providers and stereotyping actually contributes to differences in care. I'll share with you a story. When I was an intern years ago, I had a patient, Mr. P, who was a 51-year-old man, African-American man, with a history of chronic back pain. And he was on 5 or 10 milligrams of oxycodone. And he wanted to establish care with me from another doctor. 
And so I told him to bring all his medical records before I call. I call make sure there's a smooth transition of care. When he gave, brought me his years of medical records and I reviewed them, these were the words that were peppered through his records. Non-compliant, aggressive, drug seeking. Because of this, his pain was always inadequately treated for years. Now, I got to know this man for a long time, and I'll tell you, yes, he's loud. He's very loud when he comes to clinic, but he is pleasant. He's funny. He's a chef. And every time he came to clinic, he tried to bring us cupcakes. Um, when it comes to pain specifically, lots of studies out there that talk about the disparities in pain management between blacks and whites. This is for appendicitis treatments between black children and white children. Older studies showed the difference between patients with isolated long bone fractures, where there's disparities in who gets pain medications and who doesn't. This report came up years ago uh, uh, in a paper that's talking about medical students and residents believe black patients have less pain. And it sounds pretty silly, but this was actually a study at the University of Virginia, and the samples were small. But what was interesting in 2016 when this study came out was that 25% of residents believe that black skin is thicker than white. And the question is why? Why these differences and why these thoughts and these ideas? And so whenever my, my journey took me to why, I went to the history of medicine to really understand where some of these ideas come from. Because one thing my mother always used to say is, the man who forgets where he's coming from will not know where he is and will not know where he's going. And so I'm not just here to give you the history of medicine, I'll give you the black version of it. Because it was also Brian Stevenson who founded the Equal Justice Initiative, who was talking about giving a lecture about the death penalty in Germany. And as he was talking, uh, one lecturer raised her hand in the back of the room. She stood up, the room was very quiet, and she said, we could never have the death penalty in Germany. With our history of the Holocaust, can you imagine if the German government was systematically killing people, and most of them were mainly Jewish men in 2020? Yeah, this is a case for Black people in America. And the first, I'll share with you two stories. The first story I'll share with you is a story of James Marion Sims. Uh, he is the father of modern gynecology. I mean, this guy was smart. He went to Jefferson. He's the reason we have the vaginal speculum. He devised a way to fix vesicle vaginal fistulas. He was smart. Uh, he's the first doctor, actually, whose statue was put up in Central Park. But the truth is, until the lion learns to speak, stories of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. The story of James Marion Sims I actually appreciate is the story in this picture. It's James Marion Sims in a black suit standing there. He has two medical residents next to him, and he had three women there, Anarcha seated on the table, and Lucy and Betty. It is said that Narcha developed vesicle vaginal fistula and is bought by James Mariam Sims. It is said that what Mariam Sims will do is he will scarify the vaginal walls and sew them together. It is said that throughout all of this, he never used anesthesia because the procedure wasn't painful enough. Yet when he started doing this on white women, he always used anesthesia. It is said he will do this over and over and over again on the black woman. It is said the procedures were so painful that even the white residents who were taxed to hold down the woman could not take it anymore and so left. And so what James Marion Sims did was he would let the woman hold each other down as he rotated them and experimented on them. This is the father of modern gynecology. Years after I started teaching this, uh, there were lots of protests in New York, and his statue was actually taken down in 2018. The second story I'd like to share with you is slavery after death. This is an advertisement in the um, Atlanta Weekly, which was advertising for 
slave owners to bring their Negroes over who required operations or irregularities so common to Negroes. Now, there were some of these hospitals that help Black folks, but most Black folks also know that if you end up in a place like this, you often end up in a place like this, as a cadaver in an anatomy lab. Now, the next picture is a bit gruesome, but I think it's important to show them. There was a time in medical history when it, it was a thing for medical students to take a picture with their dead body, write their initials on their gown and their names, and have a funny statement on the table. This one states, all coons smell alike to us. Coons was a derogatory word for black people. Folks who took pictures of lynchings often took these pictures. 80% of bodies in anatomy lab were black bodies. This one says, her loss is our gain. This one says, his time was bad, but ours is worse, as the medical students have pipes in their mouth and pose for the picture. This one says, he lived for others, he died for us. And the next few pictures are interesting because they always seem to have a black janitor seated in the picture and clear the message they were trying to send. We see that with a black man sitting on the side. We see this with a black janitor in the background. And we see this with this black man made to sit on a bucket as they dissect the body. And most of these pictures will be made into postcards to be sent to family members. And there's so many stories out there, which in the past are thought of as mythical stories from Thomas Jefferson to Henry Talax, but to most black folks, this is their story. And, and the lesson I learned from my journey through history is that medical culture often reflects the larger culture of inequality. And we unfortunately still live in a time of inequality and the medicine we practice still reflects that. And so there are three lessons I learned from history. One is it's created a culture of not viewing black bodies as equal. And so this study from University of Virginia it kind of makes sense now. The second is it's eroded the trust black people have in the medical system. Um, I'll share with you a story. When I was completing residency, I had this sweet old black lady. Um, she was wonderful. My last day of clinic, she held my hand, looked into my eyes and said, I'm really going to miss you. I'm going to miss you because for years I haven't trusted anyone and I've trusted you. And now that you are leaving, I don't know who I'm going to trust. And I don't share this story to praise myself, but to emphasize how difficult it is for some patients to trust the system. Even for me, I probably shouldn't say this, <laughs> this is being recorded, but when I was looking for a primary care physician, I was afraid as a doctor what biases would be impacted on me. A few years ago, I was biking home from the gym. At that time, I used to use a gym at the medical school and lived by Coolidge Corner. And as I was biking home, I got hit by a car right along Golden Riverway. I was on the streets unconscious. Um, unfortunately, my helmet was in my backpack since I was sweaty, and I hit my head pretty hard on the, on, the, on the car and on the floor. The ambulance came. They rushed me to the emergency room. Um, luckily for me, I did not have an intracranial bleed. I just have a bad concussion and had a scaphoid fracture that Kieran actually came to fix that day to put on my cast. Um, and days later, when I left the emergency room, I was reading through my notes and every single note emphasized, this is a 30 something year old medical resident. This is a 30 something year old doctor. Why was it so important to emphasize the fact that I'm a doctor? Does it mean that my father who's a taxi driver would have been treated differently if he had come to the emergency room that day? And we as physicians, we often do this and think we are causing no harm, but the truth is when we expect our definition of bias to so just not include acts of commission but also omission the buckets gets bigger and that it's not just about prejudice 
but it's also about the privilege we give to some over others. The question I like to ask most friends and colleagues these days is, how many people on this call will feel comfortable walking into an emergency room in Boston as a 60-year-old black man from Dorchester? The answer to that question speaks to the scope of the problem. And the last thing is in some ways, it explains our current trends in healthcare disparities and outcomes, and even the outcomes we saw during this COVID era. The Boston Globe a few years ago in 2017 published an, a few articles looking at race in Boston and the dynamics. And it concluded that simply put, if you're black in Boston, you're less likely to get care at all our, at our elite hospitals. And it, there were lots of reasons for that. You know, black patients are uncomfortable, they don't trust the system. There are not enough black physicians in the system. The truth is black Bostonians feel five times more discriminated against or maltreated versus white Bostonians. So the question is, what's going on here? Why? Why all of this, especially in healthcare? And so when I started talking about why, this is where I started really looking at the structural racism, the systemic racism that exists that has created the environment for all of this to take place. And so I started looking at the different levers of our system to understand the systemic racism in it, whether it be world gap or employment. And so I'll go through some facts. One, world gap. A black family in America is literally 10% in terms of median net worth of a white family. Unemployment, 2x from the 1970s all the way till now. Some years it's even almost 3x, but on average, always two times for black folks. And if you look at diversity, a lot of companies out there, their C-level executives have no black person, or there's always that one black person who has the title of chief diversity officer, as you can see for Zoom that we're using currently. Airbnb, seven, one out of 17. Title is Head Global Diversity and Belonging. Bank of America, one out of 16. Her title is Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer. LinkedIn, zero black people in their leadership. Twitter, zero. Sephora, zero. Gap, zero. Disney, zero. Housing, black families are five times more likely than white families to live in areas of concentrated poverty. Incarceration, blacks are incarcerated more than five times the rate of whites. Drug arrest, imprisonment rate of blacks for drug is six times that of whites. And yet the rate of utilization of drugs is a similar rate for both groups. Infant mortality, almost 2.5 times for blacks than whites. Why? Why these differences? Why such systemic differences in every aspect of our lives? And so I'll, 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 again, I'll go back to the man who forgets where he's coming from, does not know where he's going, and will not know where he's going, does not know where he is, and will not know where he's going. Because history often is where these things come into place and they are built. So, and I'll, I won't go through all the history of all the different levels, but let's say the criminal justice system. In 1865 to now, white mobs were killing black, black folks, as well as the police. And we currently have all these police killings on, on, um, filmed on, on iPhones. From 1971 onwards, there was a war on drugs, which honestly Nixon put in place to target black people. Five grams of crack gets you five years in prison versus 500 grams of powder cocaine also gets you five years in prison. And crack cocaine is mainly used by black folks. Mass incarceration, one out of nine black children have an incarcerated parent versus one out of 57 white folks. Private prisons became a stimulus for a lot of people to go into jails as companies were profiting off of them because of the 13th Amendment that outlawed slavery except in the case for punishment for a crime. And so it's not surprising the police brutality we have in so many names, and this is just a drop in the bucket of all the names and all the people who have been killed by the police. 
I'll share with you two stories. One is on the criminal justice system. This is the story of Jorostini Jr. Jorostini Jr. is a 14, George was a 14 year old in South Carolina. Um, in 1944 or so, he was playing outside with his little sister in their yard. And as they were playing in their yard, two little white girls, seven and eight years old, passed by and asked George and his little sister where they could find flowers and went out with their way. Unfortunately, that night, those little girls did not come home. And so a search party went to look for them. The next morning, their bodies were found in a ditch. George Stinney was immediately arrested. The only evidence is he had spoken to the girls when they passed by his house the day before. He was interrogated for hours without his parents or any lawyer present. The sheriff later came out and said George had confessed to the murder without any signed document or any written statement. And so he was sent to trial. He was sent to an all white jury and no African American was allowed into the courthouse. It took them three hours and George Stinney was sentenced to death in an electric chair. In June 1944, it was said his body was too small for the chair that they had to use the Bible to boost him up in the chair. It is said the mask could not fit on his face and when the deadly electricity came on, fell off his face, and you could see tears coming down his face. George Stinney, at 14 years old, is the youngest person to be executed by the government. And in 2014, a few folks took interest to this case and managed to get to declare him innocent. It took three hours to declare George Stinney guilty and more than 70 years to declare him innocent. And most people say this is far away, but most black folks raising kids in America know that this is not the case. The story of Khalif brother told by Jay-Z tells us all. Khalif was 16 years old in New York when he was accused of a robbery he said he never committed. He was sent to Rikers Island for more than a thousand days. More than two years of that in solitary confinement. And when he, they let him out without trial, a few years later, 2014, he killed himself. All the black folks are asking of the justice system is to be allowed to live and to allow their kids to grow up and live. The second story I'll share with you is on, the, on education. This is the story of Ruby Bridges. Ruby Bridges was a six year old girl in the 1960s whose parents sent her to an all white school right after Brown versus Board of Education says separate was not equal to equal. Ruby Bridges had to get marshals to accompany her. It is said that when she went to the school, all the parents took away their kids from the school. It is said all the teachers refused to teach her but one. It is said her father lost his job because he sent his daughter to an all white school. It is said they would not even they could not go to the market because the shops will not sell to them. And so the marshals had to accompany Ruby Bridges to school because folks were threatening her life. It is said she could not even eat lunch at school and had to bring her own lunch because the people were threatening to poison her in the school, parents of white kids. And it is said one person will hold up a black doll and put it in a coffin and show it to her every day she walks to school. And every time I look at pictures like this, I wonder about what is on the other side of this picture. Racism and hatred. But racism is not just hatred, it's also apathy, ignorance, and privilege. And just as some of these folks are still alive or pass down these concepts to the next generation, so is the hope that Ruby Bridges offers. 2011, she met with Barack Obama and what Obama told her was, I just want to say thank you. Because truly, if you hadn't done what you did, I, I wouldn't be here today. 
And so the question is, what can we do? There's so many problems, both in medicine, in the system, and patients are struggling and people are struggling. And we just cannot be quiet. And so this is why I went to solutions. And in solutions, I, this paper from 2016 was helpful in understanding that a few things we have to do is to, one is to learn and accept the United States racist roots. The second thing is we need to understand how racism has shaped our narrative about disparities and why we see all those statistics and all those levers in society being off. It's because of the history of racism. The third thing is to define and name it, whether it be racism, sexism, whatever ism it might be. And the fourth thing is to center the margins. And when I say center the margins, what I mean is diversity. Lots of studies have come out showing the importance of diversity in creating a competent workforce, especially in healthcare for our patients. Most of you are interviewing applicants, will be interviewing applicants, whether it be for jobs, for residency, for medical schools. And for me, before I interview applicants, what I do is one is I go into a room and I make sure that I am aware of my own biases. I also make sure that I have an outcome of a candidate in mind of what I want to minimize my biases impacting the type of candidates I pick. However, the problem sometimes is these biases start way before that it's even hard to pick the right candidates. This was a study done at Yale University looking at medical students and it showed that black and Asian students were less likely than their white counterparts to be members of AOA. And unfortunately being AOA affects future opportunities. And so as we review applications for us, we started to think, what are the biases that are going to some of these evaluations into the Dean's letter, into the great students are getting? And how can we overcome this to make sure that we get the right candidates and not allow these biases to impact their, their, their future trajectory. This paper came out last in the New England Journal of Medicine, talking about thinking about distance travel as a measure to really assess candidates and not just the traditional measures that we currently have. In Boston, across all our hospitals, unfortunately, we are not doing too well when it comes to the percentage of black doctors in our hospitals compared to the rest of the nation. Our numbers are pretty um, not impressive. The Boston Symphony realized they had this problem in the 1960s. It was a male dominated orchestra. And so they, they could not get women to be in the group. And so what they started doing was they started having auditions behind the black curtain. And it was said that the women would be asked to even take off their shoes so that the judges could not even hear their heels. And many years later, it's now a diverse group of people, both men and women, who are making some beautiful music. And so how to interrupt biases, one is to be open and aware of our own personal biases. Two is increasing workforce diversity and truly value equity. Three is creating a system of accountability. And four is utilizing decision tools or standardized processes. Because the truth is implicit bias are most influential when criteria are unclear, which is medicine. Decisions are made rapidly, medicine. Decisions are complex, medicine. Information is ambiguous or incomplete, medicine. And when we are stressed or tired, which is medicine. So medicine offers the perfect pot of soup for implicit bias to brew. And so I'd like to end by saying that we are not, all I'm trying to tell you that well-intentioned providers are not immune to stereotypes. Unfortunately, stereotypes are not the complete picture. And when we make decisions just based on those, we cause unintended disadvantages for others. And so I'm still on my journey. I'm still on my journey and these are the three things I'm learning to do, educate, accept, and act. And for education, I'm reading a lot of books, lots of resources, trying to really learn about history as well as the present. But this is sometimes hard. It's hard because sometimes when a lie is still long enough, it becomes the truth. And so sometimes it's hard to find a real truth about history. Uh, three years ago, Tanaisi Choate came to Harvard to talk about how the university benefited from slavery. And I remember sitting in the audience and he made a comment that we always think these stories are just potholes in the road of history. This, these are not potholes. This is the road, and we need to start accepting it and start learning about it. Accept. Um, 
This is the first class lounge of British Airways. Uh, why do I show you this? I'll, I'll tell you one quick story. So uh, when I was a resident, since I was a resident, I always go back to Ghana to do my clinical work in December, January. And on this trip to Ghana, I usually do Boston to London, London to Accra. So that Boston to London at nighttime, I can sleep. London to Accra during the daytime. On my trip from Boston to London, this man got really sick. It was an elderly man in his 80s. He was having golf coffee ground emesis. And I spent all night taking care of him. We got to Heathrow. He rushed to the emergency room. British Airways were so grateful that on my flight from London to Accra, they upgraded me to first class. I tell you guys, um, I had never been in first class before that time. It was an amazing experience. I mean, I did not even sleep for the rest of the flight. Um, the bread is hot. It took me like 20 minutes to figure out how to do the seat because I didn't want to look like a village kid from Africa who couldn't even do the seats in first class. Um, it, was, it, was a, it was a fantastic experience. All I'll say is once you go first class, you don't go back to economy. Um, and halfway through the flight and that experience, <laughs> this man comes in from economy and the air hostess goes up to him and says, how can I help you, sir? And his reaction is, I'm looking for the restroom. I did a double take on that. I was like, say what? This man dares come from economy? to use our restroom in first class? How dare he, the audacity. When I was in economy, I sat back there with everyone else. I wasn't coming to first class to use the restroom. What the hell? So I was very upset about this. And I, in my head, I was just cursing my head that, damn it. And then 10 minutes later, as I was thinking about this and I was laughing at myself for it, I also became nauseous. I became nauseous with myself because I realized that in my moment of privilege, I had created a system of division no different than this. Privilege is really powerful. The privilege of being white, the privilege of being a man, the privilege of being wealthy, the privilege of being a doctor. We implicitly or explicitly create systems of divisions that harm people. And for me to accept the fact that I had the same tendencies to create such a system that I loathe so much was really, really difficult. Really, really difficult. And so accepting the fact that these biases exist everywhere, we need to be aware of them. And this paper from the New England Journal of Medicine by Deborah Cohen, a racist like me, and I don't even think this is just for white physicians, but this is for all of us to truly explore those parts that are just most unwholesome, embarrassing, and flattering, and generally not discussed in the context of our careers. The last thing is act. And we act, I'm taking action in very different ways. One simple way is I'll show you a story of GFR, the glomerular filtration rate. As you all know, we use creatinine to calculate this, and then there is a multiple if you're black. And for years, since I was a medical student and even a resident at BI, our medical record system always showed this. If a patient is non-African American, it's X. If a patient is African American, it's Y. At the assumption that creatinine was much more in African Americans. And this was confusing because if a white person has a ma more muscle mass than me, and you cannot be even listed for, for kidney transplant unless you're less than 20, for the same creatinine, he might be GFR of 18 and I'll be 23 and I will not be listed and they will be listed. So we at BIDMC realized a problem in this. And now what you see when you look in the EMR system is there's actually an explicit explanation. We took out the whole race issue and actually made a comment on muscle mass. Because the truth is race is a social construction. And it's really interesting, it's just not right when you make biological decisions based on a social construction. If Obama came to the hospital, what GFR does he get? Does he get his mother's GFR or does he get his father's GFR? This is Marsha and Millie who are twins, but one looks white and one looks black. What GFR do you give to them if it was for the same creatinine? 
And so as ed physician educators, as residents, as, as teachers, as students, these are the few things that we need to be aware of as we work in the, in the medical context. One is establish a culture of openness and respect up front. Let's recognize our biases and microaggressions, racism and discrimination among residents, among patients, among staff. And let's seek out training opportunities like this. Because the truth is, unfortunately, our medical schools, our residency program, we are not doing enough to fight racism across the country. And so these are the three things I'm doing. Educate, accept, and act. And so I'd like to end by saying, we all work really hard to make a difference in the lives of our patients. But the fact that these differences exist also tells me that we have a lot of work to do. That it's not just about being a good doctor, it's about being compassionate and thoughtful and realizing that our humanity is intertwined with the humanity of others. But this work is hard. It's hard, it's difficult, it's frustrating. And so I'm here to tell you something that Milton always tells me whenever he sees me. Uh, Milton is an elderly gentleman, black gentleman at Beth Israel, who carries dirty trays from patients' rooms to the kitchen. And since I was an intern, every time Milton sees me, proud of seeing a black doctor, always runs up to me and says, Doc, keep moving on. And so I'm here to tell you the same thing, keep moving on. And we will reach together the promised land that Dr. Ken talked about. Keep moving on. Keep moving on because when I look at some of the worst crimes on earth from slavery to colonization to apartheid to Tuskegee, what truly bothers me about these crimes is that so many good people did nothing. Martin Luther King framed it well when he said, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. Thank you very much, guys. And I think this is where we move to the panel session. And I think I'll open it up for Michelle um, to speak. Hey, can you hear me OK? Uh, Emmanuel, thank you so much. Uh, for such a compelling and passionate talk. Um, there was so much in there from the history to the solutions. So I really am grateful um, for you putting all of that together so, so brilliantly. So thank you very much. I want to pick up on your last point or your um, last comments about education and acceptance and acting. And I think it's important for all of us to be aware that we all have spheres of influence, be it in your clinical workplace or your academic workplace, in your home, in your relationships, in your encounters that you have. And the question of acting comes up in each of those moments. Professor Kennedy talks about there are two types. There's either to be anti-racist or to be racist. And a part of that acknowledging where you stand is by what you do and by, by how you act. So I want to talk a little bit about what we do in our spheres of influence and what that looks like. And I, as some of you may know, I work in global health, global surgery specifically, and therefore we interact with uh, people predominantly in low to middle income countries at the organizational level, provider level, and at patient level. And there is a power imbalance in that relationship from, from the get-go. How do you act without having these bias if you um, fail to recognize them? And what does that look like from a racial perspective? I think it's important to realize that we live in a society where race is a significant issue and therefore we must confront it on an inward perspective before we're able to work in these spheres as a level playing field. So I'll talk a little bit about what we have been doing in our department. We had long, discussions, very difficult uh, discussions on, on race and how our institution benefits from racism. That's a difficult thing to do. But without going through the difficulty of discussing these things, you cannot move forward. It's a part of the process. 
And so then we come on to the acting after we've had these conversations and we've had them within ourselves and we've attempted to educate ourselves on, on race and racism and calling it for what it actually is and how it affects what we do. Where do we go from here? And I think it's about being bold in your spheres of influence. So one of the things that we've, we've done is completely revamped our um, strategic uh, plan for our unit. And we've also implemented a curriculum on racism and actually understanding what it means to be anti-racist and what it means to have anti-racist policies and understanding the interse intersectionality. And that's a term that was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw when she spoke about originally in, I think, 1989, the term was coined for uh, the intersectionality of being female and being a woman of colour and the oppression that happens. Well, this term has now expanded to all social uh, determinants. Uh, you think about uh, other uh, genders, um, sexual orientation, um, socioeconomic status. And we think about all of these things and what you need to understand is how it impacts and there are racial policies within all of those areas. And only when you have that understanding, you're able to look outward and, and work effectively. So I think that's one thing. It's the acknowledgement and then what are you going to do? Setting up a, a curriculum that allows all of us to talk about these topics and really going back from genocide to modern day um, economics. And you spoke about the wealth wealth gap um, and annual and that was really significant because that plays into health as well if you do not have wealth you fail to have health and that is a fact and uh, how we uh, contribute in that sphere I'll come to the global uh, surgery the global health perspective now we think about colonialism as a thing of the past but we realize now more than ever that actually there needs to be a movement towards decolonialism because there's an acknowledgement that it still actually exists within art, within surgery, within global surgery, within global health. And how do you do that? And how do you form these bilateral relationships so they are actually um, meaningful and on a level playing field? And it's important to acknowledge the history and the understanding. And when you do that, you're able to form these partnerships uh, in a more equitable fashion but it requires you to understand the history of the country in which you work in and, and what the historical and um, political uh, relationships were, uh, were, were present before your work there. So I think um, there's a number of things there. So I talk about intersectionality, how to have bilateral partnerships that are equitable, but understanding the history and being active in calling it out for what it is, but also um, gaining knowledge and imparting imparting knowledge as well and lastly I'll end with the implicit bias test uh, we are all taking the implicit bias test in our uh, department uh, pre curriculum and post uh, curriculum to see whether actually gaining an understanding overall makes a difference to how we operate in the sphere of work that we we do and again it comes to that back to that point of what is your sphere of influence how can you make a difference and not being afraid to do so, even when it's difficult. I'll, I'll end that. Thank you, Michelle. Um, now I'd like to invite Shana to speak. Yes, thank you, Michelle. I think there are so many people on this panel that have a lot to contribute in different spheres. And the one thing that I want to touch on goes to sphere of influence and as someone who has just come out of residency and going into another training program, I think about implicit bias all the time and um, how it impacts me and how people see me and maybe others like me. And I, and I want to touch on one thing um, that um, was in Emmanuel slides and it relates to implicit bias, but specifically microaggressions and how those impact people on a daily basis. And just to break it down, this could be a whole talk that can go on, honestly, for hours, but it won't. Um, so microaggressions, as defined by not even me, sociology um, over time has been described as a daily impact um, on specifically people of color and dealing with racism in different ways. So there's different, there's different um, components of this. Micro assaults are specifically what we think of like old school racism, overt racism, racial slurs. And micro insults, I think, are ones that we experience more in medicine. 
And that would be an example. And, I, and these are the ones that I have experienced over time and I've seen people experience over time and are actually draining to trainees, they're draining to patients, to everyone in the health field. And so when we talk about our sphere of impact and what we can do, I just wanna to touch on this. And so when a, a micro insult, for instance, is saying maybe, oh, this person is only here because they're black, relating why they're in an institution to maybe affirmative action or something like that, which completely discounts everything they've done over time. Every night they've stayed up on call, every time they've helped a junior resident, every time they've held the patient's hand, but yet, or, or sat for the MCAT, sat for the step one, but for some reason, they're only at the same institution that you are because of the color of their skin, which, which is honestly over time very draining. It is something that I think I've heard my colleagues, I've experienced, and it's something that we just, I, I wanna, we, you know, we have to call out ourselves, but it's something that that's in your sphere of influence, you and people that are gonna be training or that are in leadership have to call out as well. And that, that's one of the things that I did wanna to touch on today. And that also relates to in, intent versus impact and also something I wanna to touch on. Um, we, a lot of times have heard, and there's, there's a lot written about this as well, that it, maybe someone makes a comment like that and they're like, no, well, I didn't mean it. And, and that's all well and fine. Um, sometimes, we, you know, I say things I don't mean, but it, we really should start moving towards well, what did the other person experience? Because the intent is what you meant and the impact is what the person experienced. And after you experience microaggressions over time, over months and years and, and whatever it is, the impact, you know, you, you continue, it wears on you. And so like we said, you really, we really have to start moving towards, okay, as people, as people who are in the health field and dealing with people on a daily basis, what was my impact in that statement? Maybe I didn't mean it, but how can I, apologize and move forward. Um, and I think that's what we, that's what I would encourage a lot of people to do because it's, it's draining every day to hear, well, I said that, but I didn't mean it. And, and I think for us as someone or people in the health field and people that are dealing with colleagues on a daily basis, we really need to start moving towards that. Thank you. Thank you, Shana. Um, I'd like to invite now uh, Amanda McCoy to say a few words. Um, thank you, Karen. I wrote my comments in advance because I knew I'd be speaking in the middle of the night and I didn't want to be disoriented. I would like to thank Karen and his partners for organizing this event and his leadership of the Harvard Global Orthopedics Collaborative. Thank you, Emmanuel, for a wonderful talk and thank you, Shana and Michelle, for sharing. Despite the terrible recent events that prompted increasing awareness about healthcare equity and racial justice, I am thankful for the opportunity for this topic to re-enter the collective American and global consciousness. During the fall of my chief year at H Corps, Donald Trump was elected president, and it brought to the attention of some Americans that America is not and has never been post-racial. Though, like Shana, I could spend a long time recounting the multitude of racial micro and macro aggressions I've experienced throughout my educational and professional career, including specific events at H Corps. That is not why I decided to wake up in the middle of the night to join this discussion. American racism has far reaching effects, reducing healthcare inequalities both domestically and globally. After graduating from H Corps, I spent a year in pediatric ortho fellowship and shortly thereafter moved to Bumet, Kenya to serve as an orthopedic clinician and educator at Tenmuk Hospital. I have been in Kenya for almost two years and during my time here, I have observed how racial bias infiltrates and at times undermines global healthcare initiatives specifically global surgical and orthopedics efforts. As an African-American, I've been conditioned to identify racial bias in my community and workplace. My academic and professional survival has depended on it. Even still, I left H Corps with a reputation as an angry black woman. With this perspective, I have been poised to identify some aspects of anti-black bias in Sub-Saharan Africa and its implications in developing a global orthopedics workforce to expand the delivery of orthopedic care. I have met both secular and religious global healthcare workers and researchers who claim that they are colorblind. Unfortunately, in this colorblind approach, many fail to acknowledge how the global phenomenon of white superiority and anti-blackness have impacted and continues to impact global development, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa. These colorblind workers often willfully ignore social and political circumstances that greatly affect the expansion of healthcare delivery. 
anti-blackness as a worldwide phenomenon started in the 1600s to substantiate the transatlantic slave trade. It involved both coasts of the African continent and substantially affected the African interior. Anti-blackness was first designed as an economic tool to promote capitalism and industrialization, but it then took on a life of its own. And it has been used to substantiate black oppression in America, as well as colonization and neocolonization in Africa. Unfortunately, awareness of racial bias and anti-racist practices cannot be developed on a 15-hour airplane trip or through data collection for a research project. Anti-racist attitudes and behaviors have to be cultivated in your own current context. Thus, I would humbly suggest that to meaningfully engage with global healthcare work, you have to seek to understand and fight against racial injustice in your own communities. Otherwise, you're functioning in the colorblind realm and you miss the vivid colors of the full picture that allow for partnership and collaboration. There are many good resources to understand the history of American structural racism and its present ramifications. Many resources were sent along in the email announcing the Zoom session. If you'd like to learn more about racism's implications in Sub-Saharan Africa, I would recommend reading How Europe Underveloped Africa by Walter Rodney or Dead Aid by Dumbisa Moyo. Thank you for joining and engaging in the global fight for justice and equality. It starts with awareness and proceeds to action. This fight requires understanding, cooperation, patience, and grace. Together, we will work forward, work towards a better and more inclusive future. That's all I have to say. Thank you so much, Amanda. And just for all the uh, participants, uh, these two book recommendations and other uh, book recommendations, I'll email them out to everyone. Thank you for that. Um, and now I'd like to invite uh, uh, Timmy Wusu uh, to talk to us. Wusu? Hello, everybody. Hello, hello, hello. Um, so I wanted to get to the punchline, and then I have uh, two anecdotal stories, and I did write it down because I can get long-winded. I like to hear my own voice, and uh, we'll, we'll get right to it. So as far as the punchline, this is what I need everybody to understand, is that we have all grown up with racist um, teachings. We've all grown up with, in racist systems. We've all grown up with things on TV that are race-based, uh, racially motivated. And so it is important that every single one of us, whether we're black or white or any other, understands that there is racism within us in how our mind works. And it's without this understanding, there's no way that there's going to be change going forward. Because then you won't even understand how the, the simple history that you've been taught, like, is completely colored from one perspective that oftentimes is not even true. Um, and so when we, when we talk about, you know, being racist or anti-racist, it is, it is like vitally important that each one of us understand that like, there, I have racist thoughts. I, and I have racist biases that are going to affect everybody that I meet. And if you don't, internalize that if you don't if you can't say yeah that's me then that means you're like none of anything that you ever learn you completely missed the point all of this is for absolutely nothing if you cannot yourself understand what it was or what it is or how it is that i've been taught at least understand that i've been taught these things from every time i watch tv and uh, when a black character comes on they look like this Versus, you know, this is the neighborhood I grew up in, and these are the people that I've interacted with. So um, that is that is the punchline. I will repeat that punchline at the end, and I'll get back. I'll get into my stories, which I have written down because I get excited. And I need to calm it down, Musu. Here we go. Okay, so in my my training in medical school, uh, I was at Northwestern. I had a, a black older resident in ortho pull me to the side. It was during my sub eye, and he, and he told me, he's like, okay, I have some advice for you. He said, I know you've been a bold, like, confident um, black man, and it's gotten you very far in your life, but I need you to understand that this is the world of ortho. And in the world of ortho, it is a world of hierarchy. And it may not serve you the same way that it has gotten you for football and this and that if you are – heard as much as you're normally heard and, and seen. He says, you know what? You're a big, tall black man. It is enough for you to just be in the room 
and silent rather than speaking up as much as you may be inclined to do. And this was another black man that cared about me, that was telling me this. And at the time, I did not want to hear this at all. And I had to learn the hard way that everything he was telling me was absolutely true in terms of uh, coming into a, a ortho uh, sphere. So I didn't do very well in my Northwestern uh, sub I, which was my homeschool. Um, and I implemented his words when I went to my uh, UCSF sub I, because another fellow, this other fellow, he was Asian, he came to me, he basically said the same thing. He said, when you go into this room, do not say anything to this uh, attending. Do not try to be too helpful. Do not try to like grab instruments to help her out. And I based, I, in, that, in that surgery, I went in, I did absolutely nothing. I simply stood there and just was present. I didn't, I wasn't my, my normal help, helpful self. I did not try to engage in any banter. I found out later from that fellow that that doctor left and was like, you know, that Wusu kid, he's okay. And I literally did nothing during that whole surgery. So I got into uh, Harvard uh, uh, orthopedics and during my time there, it took about four to five years for me to really understand this pattern. We had these medical students, uh, black medical students, usually black men, that were sub eyes. And every year, like two to four of them would never get past the, the residency selection committee. And, you know, each one of them, I always thought that there was something, about, like, you know, they seem to be cool with me, like they seem to be knowledgeable, they seem to, you know, they, they have the grades, they have the knowledge, they were helpful in the hospital, but each time there would be some kind of personality trait that the residents would mention that would uh, justify why they never even got to the committee so that the attendings could, you know, uh, evaluate these, these applicants. And it wasn't until my fourth year that I realized that the pattern was that they were just all black men. And so, cause the, you know, basically the things that they would talk about why they didn't get by like, oh, he was just so arrogant or, oh, you know, man, he was so weird or, or somebody, or, you know, people were feeling threatened by this like individual. And, and I'm looking at my, my residency class, those of you that are here, how many arrogant people do we have in our residency class? How many weirdos do we have in our residency class? You know, and you know, we, you know, how many people, you know, go from being an underclassman, become a chief, and all of a sudden, you know, they're acting like assholes. But every, you know, but at the time, they were totally okay with, you know, being in the hierarchy. And that's the thing. I used to think that it was the ortho hierarchy that was like directing these things, but I began to see this pattern. It was like, a, it, was, it was just became very clear to me, but it, it was like, I was too late. By the time I realized it, I was graduating, I was worried about fellowship, I was gone. So um, that is, that is my, my first story. And, it, and really, in order to understand that, if you, the story of the Tulsa race massacre really drives it home in understanding uh, this, this, the arrogance of the black man being an affront to society. Um, and, and thinking that because this black society was prospering, people could not stand. That is the, the basic uh, sum down to a little word. So that is my, that is my first story. That is just something I just wanted to, there you go. The next story is a personal story um, about my own racism, basically against myself. So this is me, I was in Chicago, also in medical school. I was uh, walking down the street near um, the uh, West Loop and uh, I'd taken the bus, I'd gotten off and I had like three blocks to walk to my home. And this part of Chicago, it was not, it wasn't as, in, um, it wasn't dangerous, but it, it was like on the outskirts. Not, and kind of close to the west side, which is considered uh, a more dangerous place. 
And I see, I see a, a big black guy walking towards me and it is dark. And, and all of a sudden in my, in my, I, like I stiffened up and I thought to myself, man, I don't want any trouble. And then five steps later, I'm looking at this guy and he basically fits my exact description. Like exactly. And I'm sitting there thinking, I'm worried about this other big black guy that's walking towards me, who's probably thinking the same thing about me to him, man, I don't want any trouble. And I'm sitting there thinking like, I'm not, I'm not trouble. Me, myself and I, I'm not trouble. Why do, why do I think that this other guy is trouble? And so in that moment, in that moment, realizing my own racism is like, this is what we're all conditioned to think. I was able to flip it. And now every single time I greet a black man from however, I have this big smile on my face. It is, this is the action that is like, hey, I'm just letting you know, like I understand what we're all taught, but I'm letting you know, I see you as a, I see you as a black man that I'm happy to see that, I, that I'm trusting intrinsically just because why, what, what is the reason for me not to trust you? And so this is why it is super important for us to all internalize our own racism so that we can then change the action, change our change, because it still happens, it'll still happen. The things that you were taught as a child, the things you were taught, you know, as you grow up, you're still gonna have these intrinsic thoughts. And if you don't realize that for what it is, you will act with those intrinsic biases rather than actively working to act against it. So uh, I think I brought it home. That was, uh, I think I went a little bit older, over, but that was, that was my talk. Welcome to my talk and we can go on. Thanks, Wusu. I appreciate right. it. That was great. Um, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Uh, Dr. White to say a few words now. Give me, give me some time so I don't run over. Um, this, this is, uh, you know, here I am an octogenarian, you know, I'm floating back in here and your young dudes are going to give me sort of a state of the union, if you will, as to the current ongoing realities and challenges that you have and how you're addressing them and working with them and interpreting them and understanding them. And I got to tell you, I could not possibly be any more respectful of, impressed by your whole persona, your attitudes, your knowledge, your realism. Uh, I mean, you're right on the mark. I, I, I mean, if you represent all of the young African-Americans coming along in your generation uh, and, and, and you stay with it, you know, I, I think we're going to do all right. We're going to do all right. It, it is easy, and it is no cookbook formula, but you all seem realistic. You seem confident. You seem aware, and uh, I just, I'm just so thrilled and inspired uh, as I listen. And I'm not trying to be nice. I'm not trying to encourage you. I'm not trying to use positive psychology. If I thought the opposite, I would let you know. Uh, but it, it just, you're doing all right. You're doing all right. And, and the nuances, you know, you're hitting on all the cylinders, <laughs> you're touching all the bases, and it's, it's just very, very, very gratifying. Uh, I, what I did, I, I wrote a few things uh, ahead of time, just a brief kind of summary, like take home message of some sort that, that maybe I will try to do briefly. And uh, don't hesitate to uh, cough or ring a bell or something like that if I go over. I don't, I, I don't think I will. Okay. Um, one, of, one of my little favorite vignettes is uh, what I call the, uh, the 11th commandment. I don't know if you've ever heard about the 11th commandment, but uh, when Moses was coming up the mountainside, climbing up the Mount Saint, uh, Sinai mountain, uh, he had this big, Two, two big tablets, and on them were the commandments. And as he got up a certain level, he actually slipped and fell. And uh, one of the tablets broke off and slid down the mountainside, never to be found again. And uh, on that tablet was the 11th commandment. And now, since you know me, and you're in a good school, and you're getting well-educated, if you don't know what the 11th commandment is, 
I'm going to tell you. Do you know that 11th commandment said, thou shalt not commit isms. And uh, I just, that's part that kind of, that kind of says that, that you're on the right side uh, of the equation. You're doing the right thing. And a lot of these uh, microaggressions and, and uh, various types of aggressions, including what I like to call atomic aggressions, uh, you know, can be very, very off-putting. Um, but those things you, you have to deal with, you're dealing with them, but they are really as much of a liability, if not more so, to the perpetrator as they are to you. And, and I think I, I'm, I'm comfortable in, in tr trying to constructively educate and share, pe share that with people because uh, those macroaggressions and microaggressions, ultimately, as long as they're working with any other people anywhere trying to do anything, they're going to accrue liabilities if they're perpetrating these aggressions because consciously and unconsciously, uh, people that they hope to work with and hope to accomplish things on whatever kind of team they're on, whatever they're trying to do, it's going to discount their success. And, and I think that sometimes is a way to, to kind of approach this, at least the way I, I like to think about it, um, as, 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 we, as we go forward. Um, and I just wanted to, to mention a few other little things that I, I thought I would say and share with you. Um, one of the articles that, that we read, and I hadn't seen it ever expressed in quite this way, but the article made the case that the structural racism in our society is so alive and well and real, and that we in medicine, as we're evaluating patients, we talk about vital signs. Well, ambient racism should be considered a vital sign. And I guess that would uh, accrue to sexism too, and, and, and some of the other isms that, uh, that was on that uh, tablet that broke off and went down the mountainside. Uh, so so it, it, it's so much a part of, of the reality uh, of our algorithms and our activities. It's so ingrained that uh, it should be almost thought of as, as a vital, vital sign. And uh, just a few other little things I wanted to mention, just to leave a few random thoughts with you that, that I, uh, thoughts that I think are useful, at least have been useful to me. Um, my mother also taught me to respect all people. And I, I remember that so vividly. Uh, and I've come to learn it and sort of uh, accentuate it a little bit by saying 360 degrees around you, uh, 180 degrees above you and 180 degrees below you, treat everyone with respect and be confident that it can never be said that you were disrespectful to anyone. Be confident about that. And uh, amongst those people, including those people that you respect, uh, should be yourself. And I, I think that's a, a way of, of thinking about that and a way of doing that. Another little, just a suggestion, uh, uh, be empathetic. Um, that's a trait that I, I, I wonder, during my entire career, whether you can teach that or not teach that. Certainly, happily, some people sort of have it as part of their built-in intrinsic uh, personality, if you will. But uh, uh, I think it's important to try to include that in, in, in your repertoire as you're dealing with with patients. Um, it, it actually studies show that, that you have better outcomes with your patients. Uh, patients are more satisfied and there's really less physician burnout uh, amongst physicians who are uh, characteristically uh, empathetic. Uh, another, another thing that, that we can sort of think of is we're all our common humanity is a major reality that we have. And uh, we are 99.5% identical in terms of our DNA. That is, all humans 
within the world on earth. And I, I, I think our common humanity is a major factor in our reality and in our inter interactions. And it's good to try to recognize that and try to understand as much of that as you can. And so much of what we can and cannot do uh, relates to our common humanity. So much so, and I didn't do it tonight, I should have uh, introduced my uh, remarks, it's not too late, by saying good evening my fellow humans. And uh, I uh, learned that from the great Dr. Montague Cobb, distinguished uh, anatomy professor at Howard and president of the NAACP, and editor of the New England uh, of the National Journal of the National Medical Association for, for many years, introduced all of his lectures and all of his presentations with uh, great greeting uh, his fellow humans, and I think that's a reality that that we all uh, should think about and should study and learn to 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 synergize with with what understanding we can get. And uh, I, I feel like I had a little bit of a special postgraduate education in that, in that area uh, based on some experience as a combat surgeon in Vietnam, uh, where working on the one hand, much of my time, many hours uh, debriding wounds and trying to triage and observe and communicate with people as they are just about to go into that death, and I guess people experience this a lot more now with, with the COVID-19. Uh, but, uh, but I wanted to try to humanize these individuals and recognizing that uh, I was the last person they're gonna be talk, communicating with, and I think that's a very, a very important reality. And if that wasn't enough of an exposure for me to try to be educated and, and appreciate and recognize our common humanity, there was a leper colony near the uh, hospital, the, the military hospital where we work. And things worked out so that we could organize some volunteer work uh, on an ongoing basis during the time we were there with the help of nurses and other doctors to try to treat and educate and work with uh, patients who had leprosy and they and their families were living in these leper colonies. And it, this, uh, this one leper colony, and, and that's, uh, that's a form of humanity where you recognize things uh, because of the sheer uh, devastating uh, challenges of unhappiness that they have. They, they're crippled, they, they lost oftentimes a major part of their whole face and just a big hole there where you have a face and, uh, and, and they have to deal with the fact that in their culture and, and other cultures, people will not even look at them. Uh, but but their humanity uh, prevailed and synergized with the humanity of the nuns who were there taking care of them, and they had indeed a substantial quality of life. So so I, I say all that just to say, try to study uh, your DNA in the form of your fellow humans and and synergize that. And after all, you are a physician, and I think physicians are. In the society, they're not the only humanitarian role models, but clearly uh, physicians are educated and given much opportunity and many resources to, uh, to be humane and to respect their common humanity. And uh, just last but not, le not least, uh, learn about and develop your resilience. You can learn it. You can, you can improve whatever amount you have if you, study it, think about it, and work on it. But uh, give a little attention to resilience and, uh, and develop your own as best you can, because among the many things that your resilience will help you do is to what I call compartmentalize. I mean, these things that we talked about today uh, aren't gonna go away next week. Uh, and so we have to put that in a compartment and not let it detract from our quality of life or our enthusiasm or our energy or our determination. Uh, just, just put it, close the door, put it over there and, and, and get it out of your mind and out of your heart and go ahead with the rest of, of your, your life and, and your agenda and what you want to do and what you want to achieve. 
And you don't have to lose your humanitarianism or your goodwill, but you can also close the door and put it in the icebox, you know, put it in the refrigerator and leave it alone for a while. So I just wanted to leave a few of those uh, thoughts. I'm kind of a country boy from Tennessee, and uh, you know, these are some of the things that that sort of I was able to learn coming up, bouncing around uh, down down there and in other parts of my life as well. So good luck. And uh, I say good evening, my fellow humans. Thank you so much, Dr. White. Really appreciate those comments. Um, so uh, we're getting towards the end of our time now. Uh, not too much time left for um, a lot of questions, but I thought I would ask the panel uh, one question to sort of end on. Um, as a group, the group of us here tonight, listening to all of you speak, we are all committed uh, to social equity and orthopedic care. How would you suggest we confront these challenges of systemic racism and inequity in orthopedics in particular? Do you think that it's a problem for our field? And how should we in our individual lives or as an institution, uh, perhaps the residency program or the field in general, um, address this? It's a, it's a wide open question and you guys have all done wonderful jobs of, of giving recommendations along the way. But just as we close, I figured maybe we could end on that thought. How do we change our field in particular for the better? And how do each of us do that in our lives? Um, maybe we could start with Dr. White and then uh, end with Emmanuel in the same order that we just went through. Well, uh, it's a very uh, good question. I haven't had a chance to think about that as much as I would like. But I, I would say, though, that um, it's, um, it's a win-win-win situation. Uh, if we, as a, as a specialty, step up to the plate and, and really seriously and in a determined way address diversity and inclusion and mutual respect for our common humanity uh, in our specialty and, and, and sustain that and stay with that because uh, ultimately, uh, if we are working well together, we have opportunity to benefit from inclusivity and collaboration as opposed to uh, conscious and unconscious and uh, you know all levels of negative uh, non-collaborative uh, behavior uh, we're not going to be as well off and we're not going to be as uh, ultimately as as well recognized and appreciated and respected as a profession and if we can in fact uh, demonstrate to ourselves and to the outside world that we are uh, seriously uh, trying to confront and address uh, humanitarian, socially conscious ideals, uh, we're going to be, uh, I think, more gratified and we're going to win and our patients are going to win and the society is going to win and, and appreciate us. So I, 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 don't, I don't know that, you know, there's a a military solution, and I don't know that there's an anatomic solution, and it certainly doesn't look like there's a political solution. But, but I think uh, I think there may be a humanitarian solution, and that is if we can respect our common humanity and have a sincere dedication to common ideals that are humane, uh, and we, that we a society that that doesn't live by the law of the jungle, but lives by humanitarian, uh, mutually respectful ideals. And so that, that unfortunately, you know, I, I, I think that's the way to go. It does depend on goodwill and, and, and voluntary collaboration, cooperation. But I think it's, having said all that, I think it's very hard to force someone to behave differently, particularly if they don't know what they're doing and don't know how they're behaving and don't care and don't want to improve it. it, it it's hard to find the leverage uh, that's going to get them to do it. So I think the option is to convince them that they will in fact win uh, along with their patients and, and along with their overall society. Thank you, Dr. Wayne. Uh, Wusu, you got any words on that? Uh, yeah, I, I think there, there was a time um, which I, I may have thought that I don't know I don't know if there is going to be change um, because exactly like Dr. White said you have to 
uh, one, recognize your own bias and how that is affecting the people around you. And then you have to want to change. And I, I didn't really believe that overall that that was a sentiment amongst orthopedics um, in the country. Um, it, I mean, you look at what happens when we go to our national conferences and all of a sudden the, the plane is just filled. I've never seen so many white men on a plane ever in my life. Um, and so it, it is hard for any individual that is in a place of privilege to actively want to give up that privilege so that somebody else can step up. And that's really what it takes. And so, and, and you know, just knowing humanity, knowing ourselves, that is, inc that, that is a hard thing for me to ask somebody else to do and to expect somebody else to do. But that truly, when you think about it, if we're gonna be, because what is, what is racism? Racism is the unfair benefit of uh, one class of people or one type of people in society at the expense of another type of people in society. And so in order to be anti-racist, the people that are benefiting have to give up their benefits in order to help lift other people up. So that's what has to happen. And that is incredibly difficult thing to, to do, so. Thanks, Lucy. Yeah. yeah. Um, Amanda, do you have any thoughts for us? Um, I think that's a very challenging question. Um, how to make ortho more diverse workforce. I, I don't think there's a simple answer, but I would say that not only do we wanna work on diversity, we wanna work on inclusivity. And so we have to create environments where medical students and undergrads feel like, oh, I can be a part of this. And so that means that we kind of have to self-monitor each other. Um, as many people said, we are all with racist procl proclivities um, just by the nature of being socialized in a world. And so what that means is that we can't be complicit when others say racist comments or sexist comments. Instead of, I know sometimes myself, I would just be quiet and just kind of put my eyes down and say, I wish so-and-so didn't say that. But in retrospect, I should have taken the opportunity to say, you know, that was offensive. That created an environment um, that was not inclusive. So when we speak up, against these things and we're not complicit, then people feel more free to be themselves, um, to engage with us. And so I think one thing we can do is by self-monitoring one another, call each other out when someone says something racist or sexist or that's divisive. And then that way we can create an inclusive environment, not, not only diverse, so that people want to be a part of it and people um, feel welcome. Yeah, great point. Shana, any thoughts as well? Yeah, hi. Sorry for the change of background. I'm actually going to meet some of my co-fellows for a, a sign out. But that being said, I actually really love Amanda's comments of the importance of diversity and inclusion and how they are two very separate things, although we sometimes lump to them together. So that's one thing that I would say. Um, the other thing that I would say is really just recognizing that this is in our own backyard. I think that sometimes is what I feel. We're in these liberal spaces. We're like, oh, Boston, it's so liberal. Of course, racism isn't here. No, racism is here. Even though we are in a space where we're at Harvard and it's, in a, it's, it's a more diverse orthopedic residency than a lot of other places. And the faculty are more diverse than a lot of other places in orthopedics. No, we still experience racism. There's still microaggressions. So I think that just realizing that just because you're in a space that may be more diverse doesn't mean that these things are not experienced in those spaces. I think we really have to hold ourselves accountable in each and every one of our spaces and recognize that we are not exempt. Thanks, Shana. Um, Michelle, any thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. So um, just following on from the comments that Amanda and Shana have both made, one thing I would say it's yes, we need diversity and inclusivity, but if the space is not created for those th two things to happen within your department, within your spheres of influence, you cannot expect a resident, a junior individual to be able to do that. Um, and I'm speaking to those who have the power and influence to, to create change in, in your departments. Um, I'm not sure who everyone is, so I guess I, could, I can say that. Um, 
unknowingly. But what, I, what I'm really speaking to is those who are in positions of power need to acknowledge that residents will take the default position to be silent because it takes a lot to speak up. It takes a lot to um, go home and not know whether you, your performance that day or the critique of your performance was about the color of your skin or just literally about your technical skills. Now that is something that I've experienced in my training and I'm pretty certain many have experienced. If you just hold your hands up, if you have, if anyone's gone home and wondered was it because of the color of my skin. That is a, that is a um, almost a parasitic thing to experience that keeps on occurring and it's detrimental to performance, it's detrimental to thriving. And if you want to create an environment where people are able to thrive and succeed, then you have to create the space to have these conversations so that people can speak up and be free, knowing there is no consequence to their career, the trajectory, or even the next day that they step into back into their, their own calls, etc. So I would say creating a space is a huge part of that and having the conversation, you know, getting, getting down in the dirt, I think is the only, only way to um, really commence. And um, the last thing I'll say is actually having policies that are anti-racist and metrics where you, where you measure your performance based on specific things. And if you don't know what those would be in your department, then I would, highly encourage seeking out your diversity and inclusion officer because every single hospital in Boston has one and it's a place where you go and you ask and they will have equity frameworks they will have some guidance on that because I, I, I cannot tell you how important this inflection point is right now where we see that we are living in a double pandemic we are seeing that COVID is uh, disproportionately affecting black people more but we're also living and existing in racism. And it's important to realize that both are a pandemic and black people are doubly affected. And if there's anything that can be done within the spheres of influence that we live in, within the spaces that we exist, we have to try. And as um, Rusu said, sometimes it means giving up your place at the table so that others can sit, because when you do that, we all win. But it's a really hard thing to do, so I do acknowledge that. So yeah, those are my parting comments, Kieran. Thank you, and thank you for organizing this. I, Highly appreciate it. It's um, it's been insightful. Um, thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Um, Emmanuel, you want to take us home with some last parting comments? So I will take us home with some. Everyone, every everyone said everything uh, pretty much. I think the biggest thing, and I'll share the screen actually about something Martin Luther King said, just to sum up the comments people have shared, and I'll take to the last two minutes of your time. That unfortunately, unfortunately towards the end of his life, MLK said there's a, you know, the reason, the biggest stumbling block for black folks is not the haters or the KKK or the white citizen counselors, but the white moderate who are more devoted to order than to justice. And who for them, absence of tension um, is, is, is what they care about. And I think that is something that, especially as Shana said, liberals in, in Boston, we often think we are good people and we don't want to act, but there's a lot that we need to do. And so in the last few seconds or few, one last minute, I will share this video and then we can end on this. Um, this will take two minutes. Um,
All right. Thank you very much. Thank you all so much. Appreciate everybody joining tonight. And thank you, especially to all of our speakers. Uh, I'll send out links for everything. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening.